Dr. William Schlosser, Washington State University School of the Environment. This is my classroom. Metapopulation discussions focus on species, each sharing a common genetic makeup, unique to the habitats where they live. We watch species fill the niche. We know this interchange is to see how a species interacts within its restrictive environmental habitat. Where collections of species evolve through time, it is their responses to these restrictions that shape their genetic codes, their genome, to be uniquely suited to the lands where they live. It might be the seals along the Seward Inlet of Alaska's North Pacific shores. Are these seals responding to the same environmental challenges as seals near San Francisco, California? Hmm, well, they might be similar. They might be able to interbreed, but they may also have different adaptations to their unique habitats. Are those differences enough to compromise their propagation as viable offspring? I'd take you back a few lectures to remember the paleo tour we went through, looking back in time about hmm, 21,000 years. Sure, we have been here before, and I bring it up again in the context of metapopulations, and will again as we expand the topic to the next metapopulation step, which is speciation. At the time on the screen, the current ice age was at its freezing crescendo. Surface water was mostly frozen, locked in glaciers and sea ice. This meant the water resting in the ocean was less. Sea level stood 120 meters lower than it does today. The land bridge I call the Beringia Boreal Forest was an easily traversed path for ungulates and predators between these two continents. Species of all types were connected along a path linking current-day Alaska with the Russian Far East. At that time, 21,000 years ago, elk species, Cervus canadensis, were connected as a series of populations along this continental connection zone. Genetic materials were still shared between populations because physical connectivity extended their ability to interact. The ice sheets began to melt and retreat. This was the beginning of the natural global climate warming we are still in today. The first spurt of sea level rise may have started about uh, 19,000 years ago, at which time ocean levels rose 10 to 15 meters in less than 500 years. Cervus canadensis variety nasoni is a species we now know as the Rocky Mountain elk and is found in Washington and Idaho. Cervus canadensis variety anthopygus, known as Maturian wapiti, is a subspecies of Cervus canadensis and a native to northeastern Asia. We begin this metapopulation journey to examine how population changes begin as a response to the environments where they live. Genetic adaptability reveals through adaptations. A metapopulation is a group of populations that are separated by space but consist of the same species. These spatially separated populations integrate as individual members move from one population to another. The metapopulation concept is important because species face issues related to environmental impacts and have conservation options that can be evaluated more completely, or only, in a metapopulation context. Population dynamics is the branch of life sciences that studies the size and age composition of populations as dynamical systems and the biological and environmental processes driving them, such as birth and death rates. This is the study of factors that influence the size, form, and functions of populations. Emphasis is placed on change, energy flow, and nutrient cycling, with reference to homeostatic controls. Key factors for study are those influencing natality, mortality, immigration, and emigration. Two types of population growth patterns may occur depending on specific environmental conditions. An exponential growth pattern with a J-shaped curve occurs in an ideal, unlimited environment. A logistic growth pattern with an S-shaped curve occurs when environmental pressures slow the rate of growth. If we look at a graph of a population undergoing logistic population growth, it will have a characteristic S-shaped curve. In logistic growth, a population will continue to grow until it reaches carrying capacity, which is the maximum number of individuals the environment can sustainably support. 
Growth rates as exponential or logical growth rates are all put into the realm of speculation. It might be making estimates about populations, price cycles, or a host of other topics. The quality of the projection is viewed mostly based on past performance. We try to use historical responses to show our anticipation of the future. This figure is a price projection protocol I created based on the principles of population dynamics. The realities I found demonstrate the initial shock is bounded by the time elapsed and the amount of change witnessed. These two factors drive the recovery of population levels, or here, the price, to recognize it takes longer to recover to baseline levels than it took to make the initial disruption, whether it is going up or going down. A given habitat area has a finite quantity of food, water, space, and other necessities essential to sustain a population. The carrying capacity of a species in an environment is the maximum population size that the environment can sustain indefinitely, given the food, habitat, water, and other necessities. This is called the carrying capacity, K. The carrying capacity is the number of individuals the habitat can support, without significant negative impacts to the population and the capacity of the habitat to provide essential resources. Carrying capacity is a character of the habitat, not the animal population living there. Kaibab Plateau, Arizona, shows an area where the environment has been altered. Kaibab Plateau is a translation from Paiute that means mountain lying down. The Kaibab Plateau, situated between the north rim of the Grand Canyon and the Utah border, and is home habitat to thousands of species, and all through time immemorial, were interacting at environmental equilibrium. The density of a population may produce such profound changes in the environment that it becomes unsuitable for the survival of a species. For instance, livestock overgrazing may make the land unable to support the grazing of native ungulates living there. This is what happened on the Kaibab Plateau. Signs that Otocolius hemionis, the mule deer population on the Kaibab Plateau, was out of control began to appear as early as 1915. The range was beginning to deteriorate as domestic livestock were placed to graze. So, the U.S. Forest Service reduced the number of livestock grazing permits. Hmm, by 1923, the deer were reported to be on the verge of starvation, and the range conditions were described as deplorable. The Kaibab Deer Investigating Committee recommended that all livestock not owned by local residents hmm, be removed immediately from the range and that the number of deer be cut in half as quickly as possible. Huh, hunting was reopened, and during the fall of 1924, 675 deer were removed by hunters. However, these deer represented only one-tenth of the number of deer that had been born that spring. Over the next two winters, it is estimated that 60,000 deer starved to death. When the population size equals the carrying capacity, that is to say where n equals k, the growth rate, r, is zero. When the population size exceeds the carrying capacity, n greater than k, r becomes a negative number, and the population decreases. In the case of an uncontrolled deer population explosion with insufficient predators, the population declines dramatically because the overbrowsed vegetation simply cannot support the high population density of deer. Uh, consequently, the deer die from starvation and disease, and the population rapidly declines. Before 1905, the deer on the Kaibab Plateau were estimated to number about 4,000. The average carrying capacity of the range was then estimated to be about 30,000 deer. Huh? Wishful thinking? Let's see. On November 28, 1906, President Theodore Roosevelt created the Grand Canyon National Game Preserve to protect the finest deer herd in America. Unfortunately, by this time, the Kaibab forest area had already been overgrazed by sheep, cattle, and horses. Most of the tall grasses had been eliminated. The first step to protect the deer was to ban all hunting. In addition, in 1907, the Forest Service tried to exterminate the predators of the deer. Well, between 1907 and 1939, 816 mountain lions, 20 wolves, 
7,388 coyotes, and more than 500 bobcats were killed. We are taking a tour with Todd Buck, Arizona Game and Fish Department through the Kaibab Plateau of Arizona. Different habitat types create a diverse place where wildlife has been managed since hmm, the 1950s, including a bison herd at the House Rock Wildlife Area, but it's also home to a wintering mule deer herd from the north, Kaibab Desert Bighorn sheep populations coming out of the Grand Canyon, antelope populations living in the flats below the plateau home of the world-famous condor, who may be one of the rarest birds in the entire world. Mule deer are what attracted President Teddy Roosevelt, who is famous for putting the Kaibab Plateau on the map. Teddy Roosevelt loved to hunt. He is the one who ordered the removal of the predators, so he and other hunters could have the deer hunt of a lifetime. The east side of the plateau offers some unique challenges. It's in the rain shadow so it gets significantly less precipitation than a lot of other places. Todd Buck is hauling water to catchments because they're having a dry fall and the wildlife need to have water. Since 2000, they have put 19 new water sources on the plateau. The plateau is an interesting place from a water perspective in that it has limestone topography, and it obviously sits right on the edge of the Grand Canyon so it's incredibly well drained. There's essentially no water on the plateau, and all wildlife is now fundamentally dependent on the man-made water sources, be those stock tanks or wildlife-specific catchments the agency put in. Arizona Game and Fish has placed about 170 wildlife catchments on the plateau to support wildlife populations in this wildlife management area. Wildlife management concerns are focused on this limiting capacity of the Kaibab Plateau area. This area is dependent on these man-made water sources. Without these, wildlife populations would be a fraction of what they are now. Remember the estimate of deer on the Kaibab Plateau at about 4,000? They estimated the carrying capacity to be about 30,000 deer. It seems obvious now, in retrospect, that the observed 4,000 deer was closer to the actual carrying capacity based on the limiting factor of water. Remember, the capacity of a region to support native populations is dependent on the most limiting factors of the environment. In this case, the best deer hunting in the world is limited by how much water is available to support the deer and the plants the deer eat. The carrying capacity of an environment may vary for different species and may change over time due to a variety of factors including food availability, water supply, environmental conditions, and living space. We saw this on the Kaibab Plateau where water availability was the limiting crux to survival. Without the predators in the ecosystem, ungulates overpopulated, livestock were introduced, and the water was one of the most limiting factors. Population density functions rely on the site's carrying capacity of the wildlife using it. When the number of births equals the number of deaths, the population is at carrying capacity for that habitat. If resources are being used faster than they are being replenished, well, then the species has exceeded carrying capacity. If this occurs, the population will then decrease in size. A high degree of trophic polymorphism has been associated with the absence of high variability in population density. An explanation for this pattern is that density fluctuations may influence population selective regime forms. Still, only few studies have investigated evolutionary dynamics in fluctuating populations. It is a moving target. By reducing these considerations to a mathematical model, we consider K the carrying capacity of the environment. Remember, this is a combination of biotic and abiotic factors linking to species. Use n to represent the number of individuals of a biotic population and k minus n, showing the difference between the maximum number of individuals sustainably supported in the ecosystem and the number currently on the site, to estimate how many more can be added. Well, flip it around a little to take k minus n, divided by k, to get a fraction of the percent of population growth which can be sustainably added. 
with a little more mathematical insight, we express this as the rate of change in the new population numbers through time. It is the maximum rate anticipated when achieving sustainable growth limits. We can find the intrinsic rate of increase possible within the site currently. As we study the witnessed population growth trend, concentrate on a few points of significance, like K over 2, where the ecosystem is supporting half of the carrying capacity. It is in this zone where the inflection of the rate of growth is commonly found. Well, not exactly here, but it is in this area. We look forward to see the limit of carrying capacity, K, knowing that while population growth can pass this level, it is not naturally sustainable. The R max measure is the maximum rate of new additions to the population, generally linked to the birth rate of the population within this ecosystem. That is the intrinsic rate of possible increases. <laughs> Let's light this candle to see some examples. Starting with this low point of N at 75, in this population where K is 200 individuals, K minus N gives us 125. K minus N is divided by K to reveal 0 0.625. With a maximum rate of population growth hovering at 0 0.2 per capita per year, we crunch the numbers through this formula with 0 0.2 times N, or 75, times the quantity of K minus N divided by K. Calculated out, it reveals 9.375. This gives insight to the addition of new individuals to this population on this site. It is 9.375 new individuals each year where the terminal capacity is 200 individuals. That is the addition at this point in time. Now move up the trend curve to a new location, say where n equals 180. We are moving up the trend line, so we push the numbers like before with k minus n divided by k for 0 0.10. Then using the same r max variable as last time, 0 0.2, we multiply it by 180 times 0 0.10 to get 3.6. This is the number of new individuals added each year at this population level. As we approach the apex of sustainable population size, this logistic growth value decreases. Now we step up to this terminal capacity. K equals N equals 200. Push those numbers into the formula and see that k minus n is, of course, 0. R max still equals 0 0.2 per capita per year. But no matter how much these other numbers fluctuate, the result is going to equal 0. This is the terminal capacity when put into the realm of sustainability. No new individuals can sustainably be added to this population in this environment. The conceptual idea of how populations increase or decrease is sideboarded by the variables we see here, with carrying capacity, the rate of new individuals added by the population each year, and the current rate of additions controlled by the ecosystem's availability to support more or fewer individuals. This then begins the influence brought on by populations of the same species in neighboring habitats. This may become new candidates to populate the ecosystem or individuals from this ecosystem immigrating to neighboring populations. We call this a study of metapopulations. Metapopulation is a population in which individuals are spatially distributed in a habitat in two or more subpopulations. Variability and adaptation control how each species can respond. We coin the words of generalist and specialist to describe a species adaptability. It can be animals or plants making these metapopulations. These are unique subsets where habitat conditions are suitable to support the populations of interest, but where breeding between these two subpopulations happens at varying levels. Genetic materials are shared to the point that uniqueness between these subpopulations is not significant. There will be some differences through time, but members of the species will be able to successfully breed with members of the neighboring subpopulations. They are still the same species. Fundamentally, this metapopulation concept is substantiated by dispersal. Members of each subpopulation area will move to neighboring areas. 
Breeding happens, and the genome is continuously restructured. Oftentimes, we will see an area larger in extent serving as a source of population members. These areas support more individuals in the aforementioned carrying capacity, K. It is a bigger number and has more available movement upward as needed. Compared to the smaller sinks, where the carrying capacity is lower, the sink will rely on so-called overflow from the sources to populate the sink areas. At the same time, these sink areas may also overpopulate faster than the source areas as they hit the smaller areas carrying capacity. These conditions give pressure to the needed dispersal effects in metapopulation arrangements. A couple assumptions need to be met to make these conditions possible. First, the sink area must contain suitable habitat for smaller populations of the species, where all life functions can occur, including shelter, food, water, breeding, and rearing habitat. These areas must be located where they are not fundamentally isolated from the other sinks or source areas. When operational, even the sink areas can serve as a source of recolonization for other population habitats which are connected. A habitat area needing a population's reintroduction is usually one whose existence has become threatened or endangered in its natural environment. However, reintroduction of a species can also be for pest control. For example, wolves have been reintroduced to an area because of a perceived overpopulation of deer and elk. The actionable effort of metapopulations comes to light in situations when the critical habitat of one ecosystem in a sink becomes eradicated, such as when new subdivision homes were built where elk herds once relied on the habitat for a portion of their herd's life cycle. Without the existence of multiple sink metapopulations, the herd might become extinct. There are two components of local environments on the stability of metapopulations. First, population growth of one subpopulation is independent from others. The information about the dynamics of growth of one subpopulation will not give any information about other subpopulations in the metapopulation environment. Second, the quality of the local environment is not correlated with the quality of another local environment. Reproduction is seasonal and population growth occurs in discrete time. Considering such populations divided into subpopulations, each produces unique sets of environmental conditions with different growth rates. This introduces variability to the niche filled within each microsite ecosystem with sustainable interbreeding abilities. Consider what makes metapopulation areas successful for the continuation of the population you investigate. It carries factors of where suitable and sustainable habitat is located, the amount of area available for specific life processes for members of the population, and options for expansion because of unanticipated limitations from natural disasters, shifting pressures from predation, or resource competition. Individuals within each population seek survival independent of what happens in other habitat areas. Life and death, success and failure, are all realized at the local level. Look for the limiting environmental conditions that shaped the subject populations and be able to discover metapopulations with similar or replicative conditions to serve as seed genomes of the sites where reintroduction is sought. Diversity of the population enables repopulation as a matter of design. Distributed metapopulation areas provide a few critical factors of success. First, it enables recolonization of habitat areas where a population has been reduced substantially. Neighboring patches provide colonists to the habitat. Second, recruits to neighboring subpopulation areas moderate the risks of extinction. When population numbers drop below sustainable levels, new genetic materials become available. It might happen because of excess predation, viral infections, loss of food, or even low natality. Some subpopulation habitat areas will vacate members of a species for a variety of these reasons, and then remain vacant for extended periods of time. It is only through the existence or development of metapopulation habitat areas 
that make these rehabilitation events possible. Habitat fragmentation is a big part of this process. Metapopulation dynamics is a balance between colonization and extinction. Several scenarios can play out across the landscape, each presenting different challenges to understand and to facilitate. A significant aspect is that all local populations have risk of extinction. Metapopulations mitigate these risks. A widely accepted metapopulation dynamics concept is based on the model developed by Levens in 1969. Classic Levens metapopulations are distributed through many suitable patches in suitable habitats, with significantly less integration between patches than within patches. Metapopulation clusters are in stochastic equilibrium between local extinctions and colonization of currently empty land with suitable habitat patches. The migration of individuals between these patches depends on distance and spatial configuration of the landscape and effects of metapopulation dynamics. Levin's model first assumes that one metapopulation exists in a homogeneous habitat, two, the young disperse randomly within the habitat, and three, that individuals between the metapopulation sink and source habitats interact for breeding and habitat use. Mainland island metapopulation is the ultimate population protection model where mainland leads the survival to the island populations. Mainland provides surplus individuals to support the island population areas. Although this name identifies metapopulations located on ocean-based islands and the mainland, the ocean setting is not obligatory for this scenario. It can be found in the mountains, in river systems, scattered lakes, or even in deserts with migratory bird migration use. In the patchy population scenario, all subpopulations are sufficiently close to function as a single subpopulation. Risk of extinction is very low because individuals are exchanged between subpopulations regularly. This is the apartment building with every floor occupied by different families, and the connectivity between them is high. However, if the entire apartment building burns, then everyone is lost, and the populations are all made extinct at once. Subpopulations are not independent, and demographics are closely linked. Non-equilibrium metapopulations exist where each subpopulation acts as a separate metapopulation area. They are all independent of each other. Distances between metapopulations are not sufficient to facilitate gene sharing so that when one goes extinct, it does not affect the neighbor. We see blanks in the suitable habitat areas, and repopulation is low. This is where species dispersal takes a long time, and when it happens, new species are evolved to suit the restrictive environment of the new areas. Intermediate case metapopulations are a bit of a catch-all scenario, where combinations of these conditions are all taken together. As a land use manager, look to the factors of the species using this habitat to discover what factors of survival are most limiting for them. For the ungulants of the Kaibab Plateau in Arizona, it became water to drink. For northern spotted owl, it is the habitat needed for feeding and rearing their young. A balance of habitat needs combine as species fill their niche. We have shared the vision of Canis lupus, gray wolf, dispersal in the continental USA to see how there is a source habitat in Yellowstone National Park. At the same time, unlimited wolf populations in Canada have spilled into the USA. From these nexus spans, gray wolves have spread into Montana and Idaho. Wolf pack clusters have been scattered throughout these areas. Consider which type of metapopulation this looks like. Is it Classic Levens, Mainland Island, Patchy Population, Non-Equilibrium, or an Intermediate Case? Considering this was the status in 2001, it could be asserted that Yellowstone looks like it provides a Patchy Population Foundation, with a secondary population in Bonners Ferry, maybe another one at Elk City, Idaho. It seems the genetic linkage between these populations is high. Hmm, in retrospect? It appears there may be suitable habitat areas that remain unpopulated.
As of 2005, what did the metapopulation format look like in Idaho? This seems to have begun filling in many of the open habitat areas, but still retains many open habitat opportunities. This may closely track with the classic Levin scenario, with colonization of unpopulated land. Now the metapopulation is looking more like a habitat reclamation process, joining Yellowstone to Idaho and northwestern Montana. Washington is filling in slowly. It seems evident the flow of wolf individuals into northeastern Washington comes from the direction of Yellowstone as well as from British Columbia, Canada. By 2015, the spread across eastern Washington state has reached from the northeast to include southwest Washington in the Blue Mountains where the Tucannon River flows, Walla Walla stands, and northeast Oregon habitats are joined. It also appears the Cascade Mountain Range has become home to east side wolf packs. Although close, it seems none have crossed the Cascade Crest. In 2017, the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife confirmed the Skagit Wolf Pack has crossed the Cascade Range in the Arlington Darrington area. Another, the Tianaway Pack, was scratching along the busy Highway I 90 near Ellensburg. By 2018, the Tianaway Pack has formed into two packs, with one moving marginally westward. The Skagit Wolf Pack has been replaced by the Diosbud Pack and solidified its presence in this west side habitat. Finally, in 2019, these wolf packs were exhibiting characteristics of subpopulation stability. There is genetic sharing between packs in separate metapopulations. The distributed metapopulation areas have provided critical factors of repopulation success. First, it enabled recolonization of the habitat areas where the population was expatriated. Neighboring patches developed in this recolonization provide colonist access to the open habitat areas. According to the department, the year-end maximum population count for 2020 was at least 132 known wolves in 24 known packs, including at least 13 breeding pairs. The Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation reported 46 wolves in five packs. Annual wolf population surveys are conducted in the winter because wolf populations experience the least amount of natural fluctuations during this time. Counting the population at the end of each year allows for comparable year-to-year -year trends at a time of year when the wolf population is most stable. But what about this? The wolf pack map shows 24 packs and their domains. However, this map shows local wolf population reports. The red dots are the most current, within the past 10 years. These dots show a lot of reported wolf presence west of the Cascade Range, and some along the ocean shoreline in the Macaw and Quinault Indian Reservations. We need to use some caution when these reports come in. A challenge for any wildlife biologist is to confirm the canine species is a wolf, not a coyote, and not the neighbor's dog. I am not saying that error dominates these records, but I do suggest you give some contemplation to hundreds of wolf sightings in and around Seattle, Tacoma, Everett, and Puyallup. These may be worth a second look or two. Let us peek closer to our WSU home, Pullman, and surrounding communities. We see that in January 2020, six wolf sightings were called in just north of the city. About five years earlier, one was seen through binoculars from an area between Pullman and Albion. In 2014, someone was driving along State Highway 195 and almost hit the wolf. Some of these sightings are very specific. Some even caught the incident on their game camera. Attention to the wolf repopulation of these areas identifies how the natural equilibrium will repopulate these lands. It will take longer to re-establish their populations than it took to disrupt it. In 2020, this wolf female unraveled an interesting story. It had been weeks since biologists of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife were able to track this gray wolf's movement. She had been crisscrossing Northern California for nearly two years, after she separated from her pack in Oregon. 
Biologists had found her movements using a radio collar that the wildlife specialists in Oregon placed around her neck in 2017. Since January 2018, she covered more than 8,700 miles, looped through nine counties, and went back and forth between Oregon and California twice. She even ventured briefly into Nevada, apparently in search of a mate. She crossed through apparently open habitat areas with suitable habitat sinks, Hmm, but no wolves were using it. It takes two wolves, one male and one female, to make a viable offspring and achieve continuation of the population. Then the color went silent. Now our proverbial candle is shining bright. So let's use it to shine clarity to a Washington state topic that has captured attention for almost 40 years. Strix occidentalis, variety Garina, the northern spotted owl. Northern spotted owls are found in mature coniferous forests in Washington, Oregon, and the coastal ranges of northern California. Original efforts to save northern spotted owls focused on habitat conservation. It was determined these owls need old-growth forests in the lower elevations of its range. These forests were cut heavily through the 1900s. Although all forests were regenerated, the series of events needed to achieve old growth status would take centuries, not decades. A break in habitat continuity was tripped by temporal constraints. The discussion continues still, and it is a fascinating one. Strix fireria, the barred owl, is native to eastern North America. Adults are large and are brown to gray, with barring on the chest. Barred owls expanded their range to the west coast of North America, where we consider them invasive. Mature forests are their preferred habitat, but they are also found in open woodland areas. Barred owls are competitors to the northern spotted owl where their habitats overlap. I photographed this barred owl on Moscow Mountain, Idaho in 2003. Their habitats are vast. In 2011, the revised recovery plan for the northern spotted owl identifies competition within the invading barred owl as one of the most pressing threats to the northern spotted owl's survival. The easier it is to see a barred owl, the harder it is to see a spotted owl. Again, on one hand, this is a fascinating biological experiment. What will the final outcome be? Will barred owls outcompete spotted owls in the western states? Or will they achieve an equilibrium? and continue to coexist side by side. Huh. No one knows the answer, but one goal of conservation biology is to create a natural environment where species can continue to evolve and do naturally what species do. Huh. They all want to survive. Some basic facts about northern spotted owls seems appropriate now. <laughs> the northern spotted owl, Strix occidentalis variety corina, is one of three subspecies of spotted owl. Like all spotted owls, the northern spotted owl lives in old-growth forests. The northern spotted owl ranks among the largest of owls in North America. Northern spotted owls are primarily nocturnal hunters and eat flying squirrels, wood rats, mice, and other small rodents. They are also known to eat birds, insects, and reptiles. As a result of declining habitat, there are fewer than 100 pairs of northern spotted owls in British Columbia, Canada, 1,200 pairs in Oregon, 560 pairs in Northern California, and 500 pairs in the state of Washington. They are very territorial and intolerant of habitat disturbance. They prefer old-growth forests with tree canopies that are high and open enough for the owls to fly between and underneath the tree canopy. Preferred areas have large trees with broken tops, deformed limbs, and large holes used as nesting sites. Each breeding pair needs a large amount of land for hunting and nesting. And although they do not migrate, spotted owls may shift their ranges in response to seasonal changes, such as heavy snows, that make hunting difficult. Northern spotted owls have a distinct flight pattern, involving a series of rapid wing beats interspersed with gliding flight. This allows them to glide silently upon their prey. You are now being asked which metapopulation type do you see here? Hmm, classic Levens, Mainland Island, Patchy Population, 
non-equilibrium or intermediate case. Look at their habitat areas where their distribution is concentrated. Do they have an abundance of potential habitat areas, like the gray wolf? Is their population distribution as concentrated as the mule deer of the Kaibab Peninsula? Reason these density factors with the habitat availability. Where do they fill their niche? This owl photographed on the right is a barred owl, perched on a tree at Moscow Mountain, Idaho. While I have photographed this barred owl, it was harassed by northwestern crows. The northern spotted owl on the left side is in competition with the barred owl, where they coexist in western Washington. While they may be able to breed and produce young, it is questionable if the offspring are viable. These species come from different varieties, barred owl, the Strix variata, and northern spotted owl, Strix occidentalis. It may be that hybrid hatchlings will not be able to reproduce in their new habitats. This is a prime place for further investigations. Perhaps it comes to the same results as a hybrid white-tailed deer with a mule deer. Are they viable?